many, many years ago, a very bright man by the name of Leonard Reed. He wrote a short essay called I Pencil. And I read this several years ago because this one essay teaches more about how economics works than any multiple of economics courses that one can take. I Pencil, My Family Tree by Leonard Reed. I'm a lead pencil. The ordinary wooden pencil familiar to all boys and girls and adults who can read and write. Writing is both my vocation and my avocation. That's all I do. Now, you may wonder why I should write a genealogy. Well, to begin with, my story's interesting. I pencil, simple though I appear to be, merit your wonder and awe, a claim I shall attempt to prove. In fact, if you can understand me, no, that's too much to ask of anyone. If you can become aware of the miraculousness of which I symbolize, you can help save the freedom mankind is so unhappily losing. I have a profound lesson to teach, and I can teach this lesson better than can an automobile or an airplane or a mechanical dishwasher because, well, because I seem so simple. Simple, yet not a single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me. This sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Especially when it's realized that there are about one and one half billion of my kind produced in the U.S. every year. Just as you cannot trace your family tree back very far, so it is impossible for me to name and explain all my antecedents. But let me suggest enough of them to impress you. My family tree begins with what in fact is a tree, a cedar of straight grain that grows in Northern California and Oregon. Now contemplate all the saws and trucks and rope and the countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad side. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that went into their fabrication, the mining of ore, the making of steel and its refinement into saws and axes and motors, the growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages to heavy and strong rope, the logging camps with their beds and mess halls, the cookery and the raising of all the foods. Why, untold thousands of persons had a hand in every cup of coffee the loggers drink. Now the logs are shipped to a mill in California, can you imagine the individuals who make flat cars and rails and railroad engines and who construct and install the communication systems incidental there too? These legions are among my antecedents. Consider the millwork. The cedar logs are cut into small pencil length slats less than a quarter of an inch in thickness. These are kiln dried and then tinted for the same reason women put rouge rather on their faces. People prefer that I look pretty, not a pallid white. The slats are waxed and kiln dried again. How many skills went into the making of the tint and the kilns and the supplying the heat, the light and the power, the belts, the motors, and all the other things a mill requires? Sweepers in the mill among my ancestors. Yes, and included are the men and women who poured the concrete for the dam of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company hydro plant, which supplies the mill's power. And don't overlook the ancestors present and distant who had a hand in transporting 60 carloads of slats across the nation. Once in the pencil factory, $4 million in machinery and building, all capital accumulated by thrifty and saving parents of mine, each slat is given eight grooves by a complex machine, after which another machine lays lead in every other slat, applies glue, and places another slat on top, a lead sandwich, so to speak. Seven brothers and I are mechanically carved from this wood-clinched sandwich. Now, my lead itself, it contains no lead at all, is complex. The graphite is mined in Salome. Consider these miners and those who make their many tools and the makers of the paper sacks in which the graphite is shipped, and those who make the string that ties the sacks, and those who put them aboard ships, and those who make the ships, even the lighthouse keepers along the way assisted in my birth, and the harbor pilots. The graphite is mixed with clay from Mississippi, which ammonium hydro, uh, uh, hydroxide excuse me, is used in the refining process. Then wetting agents are added. Animal fats, chemically reacted with sulfuric acid. And after passing through numerous machines, the mixture finally appears as endless extrusions. As from a sausage grinder, cut the size, dried and baked for several hours at 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit. To increase their strength and smoothness, the leads are then treated with a hot mixture which includes wax from Mexico, 
paraffin wax, the hydronated natural fats. My cedar receives six coats of lacquer. Do you know all the ingredients of lacquer? Who would think that the growers of castor beans or the refiners of castor oil are part of it? They are. Why, even the processes by which the lacquer is made, a beautiful yellow, involve the skills of more persons than one can enumerate. Observe my labeling. That's a film formed by applying heat to carbon black mixed with resins. How do you make resins, and what, prey is carbon black? My bit of metal, the ferrule, is brass. Think of all the persons who mine zinc and copper, and those who have the skills to make shiny sheet brass from these products of nature. Those black rings on my ferrule are black nickel. What is black nickel, and how is it applied? Well, the complete story of why the center of my ferrule has no black nickel on it would make pages of new reading. Then there's my crowning glory, inelegantly referred to in the trade as the plug. The part man uses to erase the errors he makes with me. An ingredient called factice is what does the erasing. It is a rubber-like product made by reacting rapeseed oil from the Dutch East Indies with sulfur chloride. Rubber, contrary to the common notion, is only for binding purposes. Then, too, there are numerous vulcanizing and accelerating agents. Much comes from Italy. The pigment which gives the plug its color is cadmium sulfide. Does anyone wish to challenge my earlier assertion that no single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me? Actually, millions of human beings have had a hand in my creation, no one of whom even knows more than a very few of the others. Now, you may say I go too far in relating the picker of a coffee berry in far-off Brazil and food growers elsewhere to my creation, that this is an extreme position. Well, I shall stand by my claim. There isn't a single person in all these millions, including the president of the pencil company, who contributes more than a tiny infinitesimal bit of know-how. From the standpoint of know-how, the only difference between the miner of graphite and the logger is in the type of know-how. Neither the miner nor the logger can be dispensed with, any more than can the chemist at the factory or the worker in the oil field. Here's an astounding fact. Neither the worker in the oil field, nor the chemist, nor the digger of graphite, nor clay, any, any man who makes the, the ships or trains or trucks, nor the one who runs the machine that does the, the, the knurling on my bit of metal, nor the president of the company performs his singular task because he wants me. Each one wants me less, perhaps than does a child in the first grade. Indeed, there are some among this vast multitude who never saw a pencil, nor would they know how to use one. Their motivation is other than me. Perhaps it's something like this. Each of these millions see that he can thus exchange his own tiny know-how for the goods and services he wants or needs. He may or may not be among these items. There is a fact still more astounding. The absence of a mastermind, of anyone dictating or forcibly directing these countless actions which bring me into being. No trace of a person who can be found. Instead, we find the invisible hand at work. This is the mystery to which I earlier referred. It has been said that only God can make a tree. Why do we agree with this? Isn't it because we realize that we ourselves could not make one? Indeed, can we even describe a tree? We cannot, except in superficial terms. We can say, for instance, that a certain molecular configuration manifests itself as a tree, but what mind is there among men that could even record, let alone direct, the constant changes in molecules that transpire in the lifespan of a tree? Such a feat is utterly unthinkable. I pencil am a complex combination of miracles, a tree, zinc, copper, graphite, and so on. But these miracles, which manifest themselves in nature, and even more extraordinarily, a miracle has been added the configuration of creative human energies. Millions of tiny know-hows configuring naturally and spontaneously in response to human necessity and desire. And in the absence of any human mastermind, and in the absence of any human mastermind, since only God can make a tree, I insist that only God could make me. Man can no more direct these millions of know-hows to bring me into being than he can put molecules together to create a tree. This is called freedom. Once government has had a monopoly of a creative activity, it destroys freedom. It interrupts this chain of events in ways it knows and in ways it possibly cannot know. Government destroys 
It doesn't create. Barack Obama destroys. He does not create. Mark Lovin.